All right, thanks, guys. If you don't know about Bishop Athanasius Schneider, whoo that dude is awesome. He is, he is hardcore, big time. Other people that inspire me today are definitely Cardinal Burke. He's awesome. Um, I don't know if you're aware of Father Rick Heilman. You know, you know him? Yeah, he's awesome. He's such a brother to me. And I, I want to uh, mention him briefly in, in the context of something. Well, you know what? First, let's pray a Hail Mary, okay? So I don't jack this whole talk up, okay? <laughs> All right. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death, amen. Saint Joseph, terror of demons, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Yeah, so uh, a while ago, you may have heard uh, my new book is out, which uh, was so awesome. I was in the hallway, and uh, I heard Dr. Hahn talking about St. Joseph. He's got such a great love for St. Joseph. So my new book is out called Consecration to St. Joseph. Now, my talk is not on this, but I have to do a plug for it because this is kind of my life's kind of apex, man. I mean, outside of celebrating Mass and the, the sacraments, this is the greatest thing that I've ever done in my life, and it almost didn't happen. Uh, there was so much going on that, you know, oh, I don't want to tell you too much because it was probably scandalizing. There was so much going on that was going to prevent this book from being published. But now it's available. You can get copies here. And it's selling like you mad. You wouldn't believe how, how much it's selling because we need St. Joseph today, right? When families are under attack and men don't know how to be men, women don't know how to be women. And uh, the world, the culture is trying to emasculate us, telling us simply because we shave that we're toxic. <laughs> high, man. You got to be high to think something like that, right? I got hair on my face. What do you want me to do, you know? So we got confusion today. We need the model of what it means to be a good father and a good husband. So I'm going to encourage you to get a copy of this. And it was Father Rick Heilman who really rallied the troops last year to pray for me that this book would come to fruition. So I, 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 I love that brother priest. He um, really helped me through some difficult times. So I'm going to be signing and selling these later. All right, guys. I hope you're not here to hear my conversion story, because uh, I'm not giving that talk. A lot of people, I've been a priest 16 years, and I've got about 15 talks that I've, I think I nail really well on all different topics. But still, the most frequent talk people want me to give is my conversion story. I'm like, dang, just YouTube it, homie. I'm like, it's free. It's, it's, I have given that thing so many times, which I love to do. I, I love doing it. But I got a lot of other material. So today I'm going to talk about the rosary. Now, you might be like, oh, seriously, that's for, like, grandma. That's for my wife. And wrong. Wrong. Very wrong, guys. Okay? Now, we're going to go through a little talk here that's going to give you an insight, hopefully, that's going to make you pray this on a daily basis. Because, you know, a lot of people do have the misconception that this is just for nuns, grandmas in church before Mass, or some relative dies at a funeral. And then you're so lame a Catholic, you don't even know how to pray it right? So many people I meet like this. It's not primarily for women. It's not primarily for nuns. It's for them. Yeah, of course. It's for everybody. But you know who this is primarily for? Men. You. Do you know who this was first given to? It wasn't a nun. It wasn't grandma. It was a man that this was first given to. Saint Dominic. That's huge, brothers. Huge. So I want, I want to give you a little bit of a kind of a chronological uh, overview of the rosary to show you what it is. Because if you find out what it truly is, you're going to want to have it on your person. You're going to want to wield it, wield it every day. See, what you, what you see me holding right now is my rosary. I got a sweet rosary, man. This sucker is called the warrior rosary. You ever hear of this one? Yeah, the crucifix is a dagger, as I'm talking about, right? You probably can't see it on the screen. Maybe you can. But uh, the, my friend designed them in Florida. They're made in Italy, but it is so nice. It's a little dagger. It just looks really cool. A warrior rosary, right? People, some people might be offended at that. I've actually met people who are offended like that. They're like, hmm, that's a little too militant. That's a little too aggressive. You know, I don't, I don't like that you refer to the, the rosary of Our Lady as a weapon. Well, I got news for you. That's what it is. But you don't have to take my words for it. 
just, uh, it's 2020 right now, I think it was about four years ago, maybe five years ago now, check this out. This dude's still alive. In Nigeria, there's a bishop named Bishop Oliver Dome. Still alive. You can watch this dude's YouTube videos, and he'll back up everything I'm about to tell you. In that area of Nigeria, uh, and as you know, you hear about Nigeria all the time with Boko Haram, one of these insane demonic organizations that kidnaps little girls and does horrible things with them and then gives them to others to do horrible things, decapitates people, burns people in cages, Christians, right? Horrible, horrible. They had kidnapped 700 girls. Do you remember that? Yeah, it was all over the news, worldwide. And this bishop, was, he was distraught because his people were coming to him saying, Bishop, what do we do? He didn't know what to do, so he went to pray before the Blessed Sacrament, his rosary, and asking the Lord for, for help. What do I do? My people are crying out to me, and I'm, I'm the bishop here. I don't know what to do. Guess what happened? He says, a bishop, he's not lying to us. Watch the videos. Guess who appeared to him? Jesus. Guess what? Jesus, our Jesus, man, the one that we love and adore. Guess what Jesus had in his hands? A sword. A sword. Holy moly, that's not normal, right? That's, we don't, that, you don't normally think of something like that. Now, the bishop didn't know what to make of it either. And Jesus didn't say anything. His gesture was holding this sword. And the bishop says it was a really fearsome looking sword. And Jesus basically was going like this, like, take it. But he didn't say anything. So the bishop went to take it from Jesus. And as soon as the bishop touched the sword, guess what happened? It was transformed into a rosary. And then Jesus spoke to his bishop three times and said, Boko Haram is gone. Boko Haram is gone. Boko Haram is gone. The bishop says he didn't need a prophet to tell him what Jesus was signifying. The rosary is a weapon, a sword. Use it. Unsheathe it to slay these dragons, to overcome this, these falsehoods and these darkness that's going on. Now, Jesus is not Conan. He's not Braveheart. He's not telling them to slice people's throats. That's not what Jesus was saying, right? But he's, to get the point across... Do you see what I'm saying here? Sword, rosary. Use it. Wow. That just happened five years ago or whatever it was. You can look it up. It's all, all detailed. That bishop right after that started rosary crusades in his parishes, in his diocese. Shortly after that, almost all those girls were returned from the Islamic captives, if you remember. And then those same Islamic terrorists handed over their weapons to the Nigerian authorities. And nobody asked them to. Everybody was like, why, why did they do this all of a sudden? Duh. Right? They met their match. We're talking about a spiritual battle going on. Not even they would have known what, what was the deeper you know, reality here. But this has power. I'll give you another example. Just a little over 100 years ago, there was a dude in Italy named Bartolo Longo. Raised as a Catholic, of course, he was in Italy. But he went off to college to study law, and he left the faith. And yet he was still searching. But at that time, it was a very nationalistic movement in Italy, basically saying Catholicism is stupid. It's unscientific. It's old wives' tales. And we now have been, you know, enlightened by science. So we don't need all this old, medieval, antiquated, archaic doctrine. We do it on our own now. Well, he was still searching, even though he ditched Catholicism. He had a whole bunch of friends who were into spiritism. Today we call it New Age. So he was going to seances and all kind of weird stuff, man. And he felt like he belonged and he felt like it was a group that he could, you know, hang out with. So he got so deep into it. Now these are not my words. I'm not saying this for dramatic effect. These are his words. He got so involved in this that he became an ordained satanic priest. Okay? I, I was a bad dude. But I never worshiped the devil, right? That's crazy, man. He did. Crazy. What was the fruit of it? Oh, my goodness. Like, he was having uh, nightmares, anxiety, thoughts of suicide. It was, it was a disaster. Eventually, over a period of time, he realized that this was not good, repented, went to a Dominican priest, which will be significant in this talk. The Dominican told him about the rosary, and he said, this is your way out of the occult. This is your anchor to ground you to the truth. He repented, he, 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 he barged into a seance one time and told him all to repent, and he had a huge conversion. Became a third order Dominican, and he built the world's most famous shrine to the rosary in Pompeii, Our Lady of the Rosary of Pompeii. A former satanic priest is now 
Blessed Bartolo Longo, the greatest promoter of the rosary in that era. Unbelievable. This has power, my friends. So let's back up. So in the 13th century, there was a, or actually the 12th century, there was a lady in Spain who was pregnant. Her name was Juana, Jane. And during her pregnancy, she had a vision. And this is really weird, man. If I was a woman and I had a vision like this, I'd be like, get this thing out of me. She saw herself giving birth to a dog. <laughs> wow, weird, right? That dog had in its mouth a torch, and it leaped from her womb, and it raced throughout the world, setting the world on fire. At the time, she didn't know what that vision meant and didn't think much of it other than it being very odd. When she gave birth to her son, months later, she named her son Dominic, and they grew up, you know, in, in Spain. And he discerned a call to be a priest, became a priest, and then he was in France as a priest. And there was this heresy, a falsehood, that was attacking Catholicism, especially its incarnational mysteries. These heretics, these called Albigensians from the town of Albi in France, they said that spiritual things are good, material things are bad, and they actually encouraged people to commit suicide. It was a horrible, horrible group. Well, this priest was fired up, and he got permission from his bishop, Father Dominic, to go on a preaching campaign to get him back, but it wasn't working which was weird because that dude could speak. He, he was unbelievable orator. He, he would go out and preach to people, but it wasn't bearing fruit, which was frustrating for him. So he went to a field in France, and tradition says, not a legend, not a myth. I hate those words, right? Because they try and debunk what, what is something true and took place. Tradition says, he cried out to heaven for help. Help me. I don't know what to do. Our lady came to him. And she equipped him with a new form of preaching and devotional preaching. Gave him a weapon to use it to bring back the heretics. There had already been, been a, a sets of beads where people prayed our fathers. Even they would pray Hail Marys. But there were no mysteries attached to it. There was no, it wasn't an evangelical tool. It wasn't something you meditated on. You just did it because you didn't know Latin to substitute for the, for the breviary. But now she weaponized this beaded prayer and told him to go out and preach my Psalter, she said. So that man went out into the streets, and wow, the power of this prayer, the rosary, and the mysteries that were equipped with it, the joyful, sorrowful, and glorious, the same mysteries that were being attacked. It was unbelievable, unbelievable, the fruits of it. Who didn't like that? The devil. See, this made basically every home into, into a little church. You didn't have to be educated. Anybody could do this. Men, women, children could do this. It was Catholicism 101. If you can pray the creed, our Father and a Hail Mary, you're good to go. It can't get any more basic. The devil realized that something tremendous had been given to the world, and he wanted to destroy it. So less than 100 years after this was given to St. Dominic, a plague hit Europe. Do you, remember, do you know about this? It's unbelievable. I'm not making this up. You know, I'm not fudging the numbers. One-fourth of the population of Europe died. At least, at least 25 million people died in about eight years from the Black Plague, the Black Death. Every historian knows this. Unbelievable. Why? Well, there's the, the physical reason, of course, right? Things got, rats got infested with some disease and it spread everywhere. Okay, yes, that, that's true. Nobody denies that. But there's a spiritual component to it, a spiritual component to it. Centuries later, St. Louis de Montfort would talk about this, a third order Dominican who would say that the devil unleashed this to try and destroy the rosary and all documentary evidence associated with it. Because that's what the devil always tries to do, burn documents, burn documents. So he almost succeeded, almost. It was unbelievable. Why? Because all these documents that talked about this were housed in convents, monasteries, libraries, but that's where a lot of the priests and the nuns were taking care of people who, were, who had the plague, but then those places had to be burned because there were, I mean, there were so many people dying, had to be destroyed. Well, that priest who had been given the rosary, before you know, his death, obviously, he founded a religious community called the Order of Preachers. And isn't it strange that to this day, 
the man who founded, the order of preachers, those who preach the sacred word, we don't have one word written down from his hand, not one from St. Dominic. Wow. Because they were burned. All that stuff was destroyed in the Black Plague. When he founded the order of preachers, shortly after he founded them, they, they became more affectionately known as the Dominicans. They're awesome. Now, remember the vision of his mother, the dog with the torch in its womb? They, they became known as the Dominicanis. In Latin, perfect. The dogs of God. That was his mother's vision. Her son would found this order of preachers, and they would be like dogs, sniffing out heresy and getting rid of it. A good Dominican, you can't match. Those guys, I mean, studying books is like a sacrament to them. I have actually studied at the Dominican House of Studies in Washington, D.C. When one of their brothers dies, like they raid his room that night <laughs> for the books. Seriously. The superior had to lock the room when one of them died when I was there. It was hilarious. These guys are hardcore into books, you know. He might have something we don't have, you know. Sorry, brother, we'll pray for you, but you got some good books, you know. <laughs> Dominicans are awesome. I love a good Dominican. Oh, my goodness, they're, they're amazing. And then, right, after the Black Plague, there was a renewal that happened in Europe called the Observant Reform Movement because the Franciscans had lost their initial fervor, a lot of the Carmelites, a lot of groups, even the Dominicans lost that initial fervor because they were worried about surviving during the Black Plague. But then God unleashed the Holy Spirit and there was a massive renewal. Franciscans got a form of a rosary called the corona, the crown rosary. Uh, the Brigitine, uh, St. Bridget of Sweden, and a whole bunch of other groups got versions. But what about the original, right? Well, that's when Jesus, Our Lady, and St. Dominic himself began to appear to a Dominican in Brittany, like northwestern France. And they said to him, renew the rosary, renew the rosary. Now, as a good Dominican, you know, he was, you know, into his books. So he wasn't doing what the visions were asking him to do until one vision. Jesus appeared to his Dominican and said to him this, verbatim. This is, this is cool, man. Jesus said to him, the world is filled with ravenous wolves, and you unfaithful dog know not how to bark. Dang! Wow, that seems like rough. Jesus is calling him a dog, unfaithful dog. That seems like, wow. Why would he say that? Because you're a Dominicanis, and you're not barking. You're just stuck in your book. There's nothing wrong with that, of course, but you need to get all that to preach, and you're being asked to renew this that was given to your founder. So he did, Father Alain de la Roche, and he spread it all throughout, and he renewed the confraternity of the rosary, which had been founded by St. Dominic, it didn't have that name at that time, but it was an association of prayer. So he renewed it, Father Alan de la Roche. Kings joined that confraternity. It spread all throughout Europe, everywhere. And Dominicans, Franciscans, and many other religious communities began to wear this as part of their habit. And do you know what side they would wear it on? Their left side. Why? Why would they do that? Because this was made and given fashion in a time of chivalry, of knights, where most people are right-handed. Not everybody, but most. And when you unsheathe your sword, you take it from your left side. Shh. That's why whenever you today see a religious who wears a habit as part of their rosary, most often it's on their left and not on their right because that is signifying it's a spiritual sword. Wow. See, a lot of people don't know that, but there's a long history to this stuff. Now, Satan did not like that a Dominican had renewed the rosary in, in, the, in the 14th century, in, in the 15th century. Didn't like that at all. So what happened shortly after that in Europe? God used a priest to renew the rosary. Do you know what Satan would do? Use a priest to attack the rosary. Do you know what priest that was? Father Martin Luther. That man was a Catholic priest, right? Oh, Wow. I mean, he really did some damage, okay? Oh, yes, he retained a lot of stuff. You can't ditch everything or you lose Christianity. But did you know that there's a book that's still in existence today in Germany uh, in, the, in the university library holdings of the University of Jena that was his book, a rosary handbook? It's been verified, his, his handwriting in the margins. Do you know what he said about this? 
He hated this thing. He called it a myth, a legend, right? The first historical critic of the rosary and its tradition was a fallen away Catholic priest. How often does that happen? That it's the priest who jack up the word of God. See, this is a Bible on a set of beads, brothers. If you, you don't attack the Bible, you might take some books out. That's going to be problematic too. Change the little words here and there because you don't like it. But then you go after this. I mean, this is a gift. This is something so powerful. But why did he attack it? Because he called it a work, a stupid work. Those are the words in the margins that he wrote. Prayed for no one, gaining an indulgence for no one. See, these are the things that he started to slowly get away from, and people after him would totally ditch things like indulgences and purgatory and all of that. He didn't ditch all of those things entirely, but it was there. Hated it. Talked about it being a stupid work prayed for no one. Wow. What was the fruit of that? And so much more, of course. So many people began to leave Catholicism. So many. What did God do? When millions of people were leaving the one true church, God sent his mother to a little nobody named Juan Diego in Mexico and filled in the gap. In less than 10 years, 10 million people converted to Catholicism on basically what Our Lady gave to the bishop, an, an unattached rosary and a man's cloak, a tilma. And it transformed the civilization, conquered their false gods, crushed their deities and their blood sacrifices. That's why Mexico is what it is today, although it's struggling for sure. Wow. And there's so much more I could tell you uh, about that. You'll have, you'll have to get the book, and we're not going to have a lot of those because we didn't send many of those, but you can get it online and all that. Amazing stuff was happening. Amazing things. But see, God, uh, the devil didn't like that. Oh, he tried to, to break the brotherhood in Europe, which he did, you know, through the, the Protestant revolt. It wasn't a reformation at all. It was a rebellion. And then, you know, God raised up 10 million Catholics in, 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 in Mexico to fill in the void. Then what happened? Satan instilled in other people a desire to attack the wounded brotherhood of Christianity. Because you have people believing in Jesus, but some said, well, he would have taught this or he would have taught that, interpreting the good book on their own, right? So Satan instilled in certain people a desire to attack. Now they're weak, they're wounded, they're not united. Now's the time to destroy them. Do you know who that was? Now, don't take this the wrong way. I'm not against anybody. I'm not an Islamophobe. I'm not a hater. But it was Islam. They've been trying for a long time to destroy Christianity, right? Long time. You, you talk about Hagia Sophia and all that stuff and all these battles over there. Well, now they saw the time was ripe to, to destroy it. And they amassed a huge naval fleet to come and attack Rome. They had tried before a few years later, and they, they tried to attack the island of Malta. Because if you get Malta, it's the southern gateway to go around to the west and attack Rome from that side. But they couldn't get it. And that was in 1565 that that happened. There was a leader on the island of Malta. I was in Malta last year. It was amazing. This dude was hardcore, man. He went to a blacksmith, John Parasot, and he said to the blacksmith that the Muslims are coming. I want you to make me a sword. On the sword, I want you to engrave a rosary. Do you know that they held off the Muslims so that they never got the island of Malta, therefore never got Rome? You know that sword is still in existence today? I saw it last year with the rosary engraved on it. It's old and it's hard to see, but it's still there. Unbelievable. Well, the, the Muslims weren't happy about that defeat, so they went back and amassed a massive naval fleet. Massive naval fleet. And in 1571, they were coming, and word got to Rome. And there was a man who was a pope at that time. Do you know what he was, the pope at that time? A dog of God. A Dominican. Yeah, boy. Mm -hmm. Wasn't going to dialogue about it right when they got there. He knew what to do. He's going to pray about it. Sure, we're going to pray about it. But that man, a pope, formed a militia. A militia. He called upon all of Christianity, come to the defense of Christianity, because we're about to undergo a serious battle. Everything is being threatened right now. Oh, we're going to pray. Sure. But we need to take up arms. That's what he said. Wow. 
And he called upon, you know, Germany, come to the defense, please. They had already fallen, right, with all the rebellious stuff going on there. England, England, the great dowry of Mary, come to the defense of Christianity. Please. They were taking our nuns to the guillotines, confiscating our monasteries, and burning our lands. They didn't care about defending Rome. Who came? Spain. Uh, Don, uh, Juan Cervantes, remember him? The, the, he, one of Spain's greatest authors. He was at this battle. Uh, Vienna, or uh, not Vienna, uh, Venice, I think it was. One of those came. Several places that were like their own countries at that time. But not a lot. The Pope blessed them. Sent them out. Gave them an indulgence if, if they fought for Christianity. Because, see, you're not just fighting at that point for, for Christianity. People think, oh, Christianity is so violent. It's the cause of all the problems. No, it's basically saving civilization from really bad stuff. See, if you're a man, and let's, let's say that you are aware that there's really bad people who are going to come to your house tonight, and they're going to do horrible things to your wife and your daughter. Are you just going to wait till they knock on the doorbell and dialogue about it? Good luck. Good luck. Locked and loaded. Come on in, suckers, right? You have a right to defend yourself, okay? Everybody today's a pansy. Everybody's so weak. They're like, oh, we just, you know, group hug, kumbaya, we'll make s'mores, talk about it. Mm. That would be great. Yeah, we dialogue. There's nothing wrong with dialogue, right? But when there's a serious threat like this, you have to man up. So the Pope manned up. And he, he formed a militia, and he sent them out. And he prayed at the church that's still there in Rome, Santa Maria Sopra Minerva, the Dominican church. And everything was against us. They had more men. Their ships were better. Half the guys that were on our military were like farmers. They didn't even know what they were doing, you know. But we won. We won that battle in 1571. And that's the only reason that you're not a Muslim today. That when you pray, you're not facing towards Mecca and reading from the Quran. That battle of Lepanto in 1571 saved Western civilization from Islamic takeover. That's the facts, Jack. But see, everybody today is so PC. Ooh, that's so nasty. It's the facts. I can't rewrite history to please you because you're offended. Everybody's triggered today, right? It is the funniest thing. I was with Father Mitch Pacwa last week on EWTN, and he said, you know what's funny? Everybody's, everybody's against gun rights today, but everybody's triggered. <laughs> it's the funniest thing. So we won that battle, right? We won that battle. And then it was unbelievable the things that happened in that same century. The great missionaries were sent out to the ends of the earth. The, the Jesuits, you know, go into India and, and, and the Franciscans and Dominicans go into South America. And what did all of them take with them when they went on those rickety boats across the high seas to, to evangelize the natives? Did they take huge liturgical tomes in Latin to read to the natives? No. That ain't going to work. You'll get there, but not initially. What did they take with them? All of them. This. Wrapped around their waist or even sometimes around their neck. This was what evangelized the world in the 16th century. Every, if you can teach people the basics. Our Father Creed and some mysteries. Catholicism 101. It transformed the world. And it went everywhere. And amazing things continue to happen. Right? I don't have time to get into all the details, but I'll, I'll tell you a few. In the 17th century, in what is now New Mexico, where am I right now? Indiana. So in New Mexico, my life is insane. I travel so much, it's ridiculous. I don't even know why I wear a watch. It's never right. It's just for looks at this point, you know. In New Mexico, there was a tribe of Indians called Humano Indians. They're not even in existence now. They were rather small, not like the bigger Navajo and Apache and all them. They were rather small. There were missionaries that arrived there in 1629 who came upon this tribe who already knew the Catholic faith, already knew it, said, we've been waiting for you. The woman in blue told us you were coming. Now, the missionaries had come up from Mexico, and they were Franciscans, and they said, who, who was here before us? Who beat us, you know, to evangelize? They said, nobody's been here but the woman in blue. So they thought, maybe like you're thinking, oh, the, Our Lady. She appeared to them and evangelized the, this tribe of Indians. No. The Indians said, no, we know who the Blessed Virgin Mary is. The woman in blue told us about her, but the woman never identified herself. Guess what they also had? Rosaries. Physical rosaries. How in the world did they already have the faith and already have rosaries? 
Well, as these missionaries kept great journals back then, they would send these things back to Spain because this was an endeavor for the church, but also for the king and queen of Spain, right? So they kept journals, they sent them back, and over a period of time, it took quite a few years, it was, became known that there was a very, very famous mystic in Spain, a nun called Mary of Agreda. She could bilocate, and she had a blue habit. And she was writing a a, a work on the Blessed Virgin Mary called The Mystical City of God, an amazing woman. She was being sent by God to a people she didn't know to tell them about the faith, telling them missionaries were coming, and her sisters made rosaries in the convent, and she took the excess ones and gave them to the Indians. All this is verified in historical, secular documents. Wow. If you go to that church today in New Mexico... Uh, I forget the name of the town. It's a small little town. You go, they have the, the, the plaques, which they copied from that time, talking about this correspondence. Amazing stuff. And then in the next century, something incredible happened. This will blow your mind, guys. 1754 in Colombia, South America. They had already been evangelized. You know, this whole village was Catholic. Well, this woman whose husband had already uh, deceased, she had a daughter who had a lot of health problems. She couldn't speak. She couldn't hear. Uh, you know, she, she had a lot of health issues. One day, they were away from the village gathering things, probably wood, and uh, a storm broke out, a violent storm. They took refuge in this huge slate cliff rock thing. It's, it's an impressive thing to see. And they sought refuge from the storm. When they were there, they saw a beautiful woman and a little boy. And they knew who it was because they'd been evangelized. They were Catholic. They knew it was the Virgin Mary and the child Jesus. They were ecstatic, right? The little girl couldn't communicate this, but it it was obvious. You know, she she was seeing it as well. The mother wanted to tell people in the village, but she thought they're going to think I'm crazy. So they continued to go back there to pray, to visit it, and they never saw it again. Well, shortly after that, because the girl had horrible health, the little girl died, dead. The whole village was preparing the funeral, priest included. They're about to celebrate the funeral mass. The mother, distraught, takes the dead girl in her arms and runs out of the village. Everybody's just thinking, oh, you know, she's just having a moment or whatever, you know. And she runs out of the village. Where does she go? To the rock cliff. She goes there and she prays for her little girl. Guess what happens? The little girl comes back to life. Now she can hear, she can speak, she can everything. They go back to the village, and both of them are telling the people what happened, and everybody knows that girl. Everybody knew that girl was dead. They were about to say the funeral mass. Now that girl can talk and speak, and she's talking about what happened. A whole village goes to the rock cliff. When they get there, they see a painting on the rocks, life-size, not like something weird like people give me all the time. Father, do you see it? I'm like, dude, it's a bug on your camera, okay? That happens so frequently to me. It's crazy, right? Maybe it's a, gift for, it's a gift for you, I guess. I just see a bug, homie. You know, I don't know. But I don't know. I don't want to ruin anybody's day. But it's a bug. Uh, anyway, so this is life-size. I mean huge. Just as clear as you're seeing me right now, even clearer with beautiful colors. And it, everybody was like, did you paint this? This is amazing. And they said, we've never seen this. This wasn't here. A minute. This has never been here. The priest came, and they knew who it was immediately. It was Our Lady, of course, holding the Christ child. On one side was St. Dominic, and Our Lady was giving the rosary to St. Dominic. On the other side is St. Francis, and he's being given a friar's cord like you see them wear, right? And they thought, who did this? Nobody confessed to painting it. Well, as time went by, people began to go there and pray there and spend a lot of time there. Nobody confessed up to painting it. People being people, I probably would have done the same thing. They started to chip at it. I'll take a little piece, you know. Take it back to home, their house, you know, people being people. But it didn't go away. Sure, a little chunk was missing, but the colors were still there, just a little deeper. What's up with that, right? Odd. Paint going deep into a rock like that. People being people, probably teenagers, no offense. I probably would have done something like this stupid too in my youth. They tried to smear it. They tried to smear it, right? Guess what? It didn't smear at all. What's up? Nobody could explain this thing until geologists came and bored into the rock three feet deep, took a core sample out. Do you know what they discovered? (laughs) There ain't no paint. There's no pigment. This ain't a painting. God put this life-size image 
in the rock at least three feet deep. Science, all fields of science today that have gone there and studied it have zero explanation for this. None. It's just as miraculous in many ways as the tilma, which, by the way, I love how Scott Hahn talks about the tilma in Guadalupe. You ever hear him say that Our Lady basically took a selfie and left it in Mexico City? <laughs> you know, I love that. That's perfect. <laughs> Pretty much. Well, in Colombia, God put this image in a rock, and you know it's still there. It's a shrine. It's actually a basilica. John Paul II talked about it during his pontificate. It's an approved place. It, Our Lady of Las Lajas in Colombia. Not a lot of people jumping on a plane to go to Colombia these days, right? No offense if you're from Colombia, but you know, it's a little sketchy, especially for a white dude, okay? <laughs> so, that's real. That happened in 1754, and almost nobody knows about it. Mind-blowing stuff, guys. Who didn't like that? Satan. See, God, he, remember when he says the rocks will cry out? Because people had be begun to deny the rosary again, especially priests. And so God put it into a rock. Satan, not liking it, Satan went back to the, where the rosary was given to, to the world. France, remember, St. Dominic. And he stirred up a revolution, the French Revolution. It always cracks me up how people celebrate the French Revolution. Do you have any idea what the French Revolution did to the Catholic Church? Holy moly. These lunatics took nuns to the guillotine. What man cuts off a nun's head? You're crazy. This is what they did. But they didn't stop there during the French Revolution. They marched into the Cathedral of Notre Dame. Remember the one we watched burn on TV last year? They went in there. The leaders of the French Revolution brought in a prostitute. I'm not making this up. And they had her lie half naked on the altar. And they shouted out something to her repetitively. Do you know what it was? Hail, goddess full of reason, to a half-naked prostitute on the altar in Our Lady's Cathedral. Hail, goddess, full of reason. Interesting. If the devil could mock the Hail Mary, I wonder what he would say. Certainly not Hail Mary, full of grace. Hail, goddess, full of reason. Satan went back to, the, to, to France to mock Our Lady, to mock the sweet Ave. Horrible. Oh, God was not pleased with that Ave of the rationalist? Mm -mm, not at all. God would raise up a whole, whole wave of rosary promoters. God would send Our Lady again back to France to a little girl named Bernadette Subiru, and Our Lady would hold a rosary in her hands. You can get no greater endorsement for the rosary than when the Mother of God holds it and prays it, the parts she can. She's not a sinner, so she doesn't pray, forgive us our sins in the Our Father. But Our Lady prayed parts of the rosary with little Bernadette Subiru. It spread everywhere. And then God raised up great people like Bartolo Longo. Remember him? The satanic priest? God basically said to Satan, okay, I see what you've done. You think that you can do this? I'll raise up a man who worshipped you to build the world's most famous basilica to the rosary in Pompeii, which is what he did. I've been there. It's unbelievable, that basilica. That's what a church should look like. Holy moly, it's gorgeous. Built by a former satanic priest. And then wave after wave would come with major rosary promoters. A pope, Leo XIII, who would write 11 encyclicals on the rosary, guys. What the heck else was he doing, right? 11 encyclicals? That's, that's just encyclicals. Apostolic letters, other letters to bishops' conferences. He was uh, Pope Leo XIII. Why that man is not a saint blows my mind. It's unbelievable. That guy was so on fire. And then after him, you had amazing things happen with Our Lady of Fatima, which is interesting. When she came to Fatima in 1917, we call it Our Lady of Fatima, and rightly so. Nothing wrong with that. But how did Our Lady identify herself? What title did she give herself? I am the Lady of the Rosary. And she told the children to pray it every day because it'll change history. It'll stop wars, because it does. This is a history maker. It changes things. And then after that, oh, things were just kept going. When you've got St. Maximilian Kolbe found in the Militia Immaculata, where he told all of his knights that this was their sword, their sword. And then, and then you had Frank Duff with the Legion of Mary, who based his spirituality off St. Louis de Montfort's Marian consecration and the rosary, 
and the rosary. Then you had Father Kentenek, who, who founded the, the Schoenstatt movement, who talked about the rosary. I have great quotes from him in one of my books. And, and now there's the, the Schoenstatt rosary campaign, which is worldwide. It's unbelievable. This stuff spread everywhere. And then other apparitions throughout the 20th century talking about the rosary. Whether it was uh, Our Lady of Cabejo, talk about the regular rosary and also the Seven Sorrows rosary. I don't have time to get on that. Another powerful one. Our Lady of Coapa in Nicaragua, approved by the local bishop and almost nobody knows about it. Akita, Japan, talking about the rosary. But so many don't listen, especially us men. We think that we don't need this. We think, oh no, that's just for people who are weak. And Darn right it is. How, how are you going to slay a dragon without a sword? You ain't. You're not. If you're not having a devotional life, and if you're not doing these kinds of things, brothers, you're toast. That fire from the Satan is strong. Your hands, what are you going to throw a punch at the devil? Your hand made from dust ain't going to do dank against Lucifer. But spiritually, you've been given a weapon to unsheathe it, to slay him on a daily basis. This is what we as men need to know in a particular way. Because we thought, we've thought for the longest time now that this is just for our wives, our, our grandmothers, and for nuns. Mm -mm. You are the one who should be doing it. You are the one who should be doing it with your wife, with your children, leading the family in prayer. Studies show, guys, that if it's the man, the husband, the father who leads the family in prayer, who's the one who takes the initiative and takes them to church, it has staying power. If it's only mom who does the religious stuff, Chances are, studies show, once they go off and leave the nest and go to college, that's going out the window. That was just mom. But when dad does it, there's something different. When the little boy sees his dad on his knees praying, it has power. You know, I remember, my, my biological father is deceased now, but before he died, you know what he gave me? He gave me his rifle that he, he used to go hunting with. And he said, here, I want you to have this. I, this I've, I shot this, you know, 10-point buck on this. I got, I was, I'm like, wow, thank you. I still have it. I'm not going to chuck that gun. My dad gave that to me. Imagine if fathers said to their sons, son, see this rosary? It's tattered. I've had to repair it multi many times. This is the rosary that I, I protected our family with. This, when I met your mother, this is the rosary I was pr praying. I, your mother, the, the joy of my heart, I'm going to give it to you, boy. He ain't going to get rid of it. He's going to keep it. See, we got, to, we got to start these kind of things again. we got to get back to these kind of things. And we've got to fight for what's right in our culture. Because today we've lost it. Today people don't even know which bathroom to use. People are so confused, identifying as cats. I'm not kidding. You know this, right? We've lost our mind. Common sense has gone out the window. We are the leaders we are the heads of families. Oh, people don't like to hear that. Oh, how dare you? Don't patronize me. Well, we've got to get this stuff back. We've got to be conformed to the pattern of Jesus and Joseph. We've got to be servant leaders, sacrificial men, not hoarding it over those entrusted to our care, but showing that servant leadership, lovingly sacrificing everything. And then women will want to be under our care again. And they won't want to dress like us, walk like us, and all that. It's the funniest thing how the feminist movement says that they hate men, and yet they end up all looking like dudes. I don't get it, right? I can't tell the difference half the time. I'm like, you hate men, but you look just like one. I don't understand this. It's the strangest thing. All right, I'm going to tell you lastly about this, okay? Because you need to know about this. Because I meet some people on occasion who are great people, well-intentioned, well-intentioned, right? But they say, oh, I don't pray these luminous mysteries. I'm a traditional rust. I get it. So am I, right? But when you've got new threats, heaven can reload the weapon to, to, to attack, go after something that wasn't attacked in the 13th century, right? Because trust me. There have been many people before John Paul II who talked about other mysteries. Actually, I'll give you a little secret here. St. John Paul II is not the inventor of the luminous mysteries. He gave them to us in 2002 as an option, as an option. But why would you not want to pray them, right? 
There are people way before him who talked about this. Even Sister Lucia dos Santos, the visionary of Fatima, talked about other mysteries. Father Patrick Payton, one of the greatest promoters of the rosary in the 20th century, even St. Louis de Montfort talked about other mysteries. But his books were buried in a field in France for like 150 years. Nobody knew about it. But now if you read his works, you can see this guy actually mentioned other possible mysteries. Interesting. Why? Because there were certain things in the 13th century that weren't being attacked. Let's go through them. The first luminous mystery, the baptism of Jesus in the Jordan. Why would we meditate upon this today? Because so many people are not baptizing their kids. I wasn't baptized until I was 10 years old, and even then it didn't mean anything for the family. They just got the 8 by 11 certificate to shut up the grandparents, you know. But I meet so many people today, so many people who say to me, well, you know, I, I'm a spiritual person. I don't believe in institutionalized religion, but I'm a spiritual person. I'm like, right, kind of like Lucifer. That don't mean dink, homie, right? You're trying to impress me with your little merit badge. Being a spiritual person is not an option. Just want to make that clear. So what else you got? And they're like, well, I, I'm going to wait till my children grow so that they can make that very important decision for themselves. <laughs> that is horrible parenting 101. Would you say to your little baby, hey, it's your call. You want to eat? I'm not, yeah. That baby dead. These are sacraments. Baptism is the gateway to the greatest sacrament, to Holy Communion, right? So many people are not baptizing their kids today because today we're so confused. That's why we have this mystery today. What about the second luminous mystery? This is a humdinger right here, my friends. Cana, the wedding feast of Cana. Why? Of all the mysteries in the New Testament we could meditate on, would this be one of them? Because in the 13th century, two dudes weren't trying to get married, or two women. Even the heretics back then would have been like, yeah, no. <laughs> right? But today, we think this is normal. We got modern families today who think this is actually legit. This ain't legit. Look, we all got problems. I got wounds. I got baggage. I got quite a few relatives, actually, who are SSA, same-sex attracted. I love them. God loves them. I don't condemn anybody. We're all wounded carrying a heavy cross, all of us. But there's right and there's wrong. I can't be some rabid heterosexual either. Well, I'm a priest. I ain't going to do any of that. But nonetheless, everybody's called to be chaste in their vocation, right? But today, we've got whole nations who, who, who have put this stuff into law that, that, that Larry and Tim can get married. Sorry if your name is Larry and Tim, okay? But <laughs> any random name will work, okay? So what this mystery is telling us that Jesus is only present in a wedding that's between a man and a woman, this is why we meditate upon this. Thing. God is very much offended by how we've redefined marriage today, how others have redefined marriage. This is not pleasing to God. When you pray that decade, you're making reparation to our God who is so offended by this and to our lady who is so hurt by this. The third mystery, the proclamation of the kingdom, call to conversion. Convert? What's conversion? Penance. What's that? People don't even know what that stuff is today. They're clueless. Convert. People today are basically told Christianity is one of many options. Whatever floats your boat, dude. That's so wrong. People, so many Catholics today are ashamed to be Catholic. And then when they do say they're Catholic, they got jacked up ideas, like some politicians right now. How could you possibly say that you're a Catholic and you're in favor of abortion? That don't work, bro. And yet, that's what people think, because they've been so poorly catechized, and they just they don't get it. We've got to get back to this stuff. We've got to get back to the fundamentals. We've got to convert our hearts. Jesus is not one of many options. And that leads us into the next mystery, the transfiguration. Why would we meditate upon that today? Because Jesus is not a guru. You know, a lot of people group all these religions together today, religious pluralism, and just say, well, you can Buddhism and Shintoism and Taoism and Islam and Judaism and Christianity, they're all the same pathways to nirvana. <laughs> what? No, they're not. Jesus is the only way to the Father. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. And that's not me being arrogant. That's the truth. I'm not saying that all these other religions don't have parts of the truth. They do. And many of them are good people. But we have the fullness of the truth. And it's not arrogant to say that. Do we not live it many times? Totally. Me first. I fall flat on my face, Father, without confession. I'm, I'm big time trouble. But I don't deny the truth. 
just like I don't deny mathematics. Two plus two equals four. Always. It don't equal five. You know, there's people today, even in the church, who say that it does. <laughs> we got some serious problems today. We got today people who actually want to talk about Islam being basically the same as Christianity. It ain't. It ain't. And I'm not an Islamophobe. I don't desire the death of any Muslim. But I want them to come to know Jesus Christ, the fullness of the truth, who wants them to be their brother and call God Abba, Daddy. That's what it's all about. See, I pray for the day when Our Lady comes in another apparition to Mecca, standing on top of the Kaaba with the divine child in one hand and a rosary in the other. Convert all of them, just like she did in Guadalupe. Transform all of them and make them all Catholic. Then we'll have a revolution when this happens because all those Muslim babies will become Catholic babies because they got a lot of babies. We're the ones contracepting ourselves out of existence because we're weak. We're not willing to make sacrifices. And then the last mystery, the institution of the Eucharist. Why would we meditate upon this today? Easy. Just last year, a study came out. I think it said like 60-some percent of Catholics don't believe in the real presence of Jesus Christ in the Blessed Sacrament. 60-some percent. What in the world? Who duped us? How have we been deceived? This is Jesus Christ. It's not just some little symbol. He's really there. Even demons know this. And yet we, who claim to be Catholic, don't believe it. Sixty-some percent. Oh, Lord, forgive us. Forgive us for our placement of tabernacles down the hallway. What have we done in our churches? We need to get this back, the centrality of the Eucharist, because then we'll get everything else right. And when it's us men who do it, we can correct these wrongs in society, in our parishes, in our dioceses. we got to get on our knees, brothers. You have got to unsheathe this weapon on a daily basis. You need to carry this on your person and use it to slay the dragon. God bless you, brothers. Thank you so much.